Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. And welcome to the Molana Suleiman Rabbit show here on Hilal TV. We are coming to you live this evening from our studios here in Sunning Hill, Johannesburg. Another week has lapsed, a week of load shedding and a week of heat in most parts of the country. Uh, today, you know, in Lens, just, just before Juma, there was, there was thunder. And, and I just come home to pop in just to, you know, refresh and make wudu before I went to the masjid. And I looked at the wife and the wife looked at me and she said, maybe, just maybe we're going to get some rain. And before we completed the sentence, there was a, another uh, sound of, of thunder, louder, longer. And I thought, well, hopefully, inshallah, didn't come though. <laughs> so we had a period of prolonged and, 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 and a lot of rain, mashallah. And now it's uh, a number of days of, uh, of intense heat in various parts of the country. But uh, such is the weather. It fluctuates. And in the fluctuation also, uh, it creates a little bit of diversity. You know, if it's only uh, we uh, wet weather all the time, it becomes monotonous. If it's only hot weather all the time, uh, it becomes monotonous as well. Uh, the load shedding is much more of a challenge to deal with and to contend with. Uh, we say to ourselves that it's uh, part of life, but it's a difficult, a very difficult part of life. As I was leaving the studio, uh, the, I was, as I was leaving home about an hour and a half ago, um, the wife was looking at her phone and she said, oh, weekend, stage three. I said, hey, don't worry uh, too much about what they say, stage three. They'll say stage three tonight, tomorrow they'll say something, trip somewhere, we're back to stage five or stage six. So just continuously brace yourself for the worst. But on, on, on uh, another front, it's been the week of uh, metric results. There's been some controversy and debate around why uh, the metric results have been delayed somewhat uh, this year. Uh, politicians have been making all sorts of statements. The EFF have been very critical of the government. But yesterday, the minister um, announced the results and up from uh, previous years. And, and she was quite, you know, uh, happy about it, saying that, look, this is the, the, the class that had uh, two years of, of online teaching uh, at the, you know, at, at, during the pandemic, and we were worried about this particular class, and, and they've done well, and, and she was happy. In terms of uh, Muslim schools, I mean, fantastic. You know, as always, alhamdulillah, it's, it's such a joy uh, to see Muslim boys and Muslim girls achieve. Uh, it's such a great form of da'wah uh, when we reflect that um, Muslims ex excel in, in various uh, ways, at, uh, in various areas. Uh, especially education. And it talks about the strength uh, of, of education at the Muslim schools. Um, even Muslim students in, in these uh, private, posh private schools are doing very well. And it gives us great, uh, great happiness and great joy. And then uh, Al-Fala School, uh, their student, their Husna, uh, coming joint first uh, nationally. SubhanAllah, that was something really uh, amazing. But it's also time for us to kind of reflect, you know, when it comes to Muslim schools in our country, um, 30 odd years, how far have we come, what have we achieved, where have we fallen short, uh, where are we currently, what are the challenges, and then where to from here? Muslims always are futuristic, that, uh, you know, okay, whatever we've achieved, alhamdulillah, whatever we've slipped up on, may Allah make us uh, maaf, and may we be forgiven, and maybe we learn from it. But uh, it's all about moving forward. It's not about dwelling on the successes of the past and becoming complacent because, you know, it creates stagnation. Stagnation results in retrogression and things can slip away uh, rather quickly. So we always have to be looking at how we can improve and how we can build and how we can, uh, you know, do more for the generation to come. Because if each generation does for the generation that is to come more than it does for itself, that is when you, when you prosper as an ummah. That is when you prosper as a nation. Okay. So let me introduce my guest uh, for this evening, three of them with me in studio, the principal of the Rustenburg Muslim School, Mr. Ismail Hassan. Long history in uh, education, mashallah, uh, right from the origins of uh, Muslim schools back in the 80s and the uh, AMS, uh, had a stint also abroad teaching. Uh, Jazakumullah for your time and welcome to the program. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah for having me on the program. Uh, alhamdulillah. It's actually a pleasure to be on your program. I'm an ardent follower of your lectures and uh, to meet you personally several times and to be on your mailing list, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Exactly. And then also joining us via Zoom out in Lanesia, we've got uh, Ibrahim Bay Saluji. Uh, he's also got a long track record when it comes to Muslim schools and education uh, as well as EMS and he's currently still involved in EMS, although he's not actively involved in, uh, in teaching. Uh, Ibrahim Bay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakala Molana for inviting me and 
Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and talk to people out there. Alhamdulillah, your programs are very, very interesting and very thought-provoking. Especially, I like your political ones very much because, you know, I've always been interested in politics. <laughs> but Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah for giving me this opportunity. And inshallah, let's hope that we have a fruitful discussion this evening. Inshallah. And we cross over now to Durban, also joining us via Zoom. We have the Deputy Principal of the Al Falah College, Brother Abdullah Suji. He's also got a fairly long track record, mashallah, in education in Muslim schools. Uh, I think the bulk of his career was at the Roshni Muslim School in various positions, including principal. There was also a stint at the Johannesburg Muslim School, uh, amongst other things. Uh, it's just what I can remember off the top of my head that I'm mentioning. Uh, gentlemen, please do forgive me for not doing justice to your profiles and to your biographies, but it's in the interest of time. Abdullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope I'm clear now. I'm just having some issues with the link up. Uh, Jazakallah khair for having me on to this program, which I think is exciting and interesting and relevant contemporarily as well. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah. We, we can hear you loud and clear. I'm sure they'll sort out the, the, the visuals in a bit. Okay, Ismail, but before we talk about uh, Muslim schools, you, just your broad thoughts about uh, the matric results specifically for this year. I think uh, if you look overall, Muslim schools have always performed uh, very well, uh, above the norm. And to have 10 in Gauteng, 10 learners, uh, I mean, four learners in the top 10. Mm. Uh, you're telling me Abdullah, brother Abdullah's daughter, or one of the students there mm. was number one. We have a girl from our uh, Zinyavel Secondary School, the state school, number three. Nationally, uh, nationally number nationally. three. So, you know, those, these are achievements that we have to look at. As, as you mentioned in the introduction of your program, that Muslim schools have played a role. Uh, in our days, we didn't have a choice. Uh, we, were, we had to go to government schools. But when we started with this idea, there's a lot of skepticism from communities. Why do you want to take over the job of the government or anything of that sort? Mm. But it was, it was a necessary thing because we, we didn't have a choice. Let's give our children a choice. And I believe with that, uh, 30, 32, 33 years on, I think we've done a remarkable job. And uh, a credit to, uh, you know, Mohammed by Dokrat, Ibrahim uh, Saduji. These were the people that started the whole uh, initiative, and it's carried on all this time. Uh, maybe it's died off now in terms of the activities in EMS, mm -hmm. but coming from where I was with EMS in the beginning, it was absolutely ultra dynamic. MashaAllah. Well, let's see if we can get Ibrahim Bai up on the, the screen here. Ibrahim Bai, are you still with us? Yes, I'm with you. Can you see me? All right. So, Ibrahim Bai, you, your thoughts on the matric results and, and especially the performance of Muslim schools? Mulana, I think if we look at the matric results, I think Ems Muslim schools have always performed exceptionally well. And I must say that, you know, our, our learners, our educators play a prominent role in, you know, in achieving these results. Every school, I think we need to give, you know, uh, we need to praise the Muslim community of South Africa in that, you know, all this is self-sufficient. We've, we've created these buildings, we've created this infrastructure. We've, every Muslim community, in wherever these schools are, have, have played a prominent role in establishing these schools. So, you know, while the government does give us a subsidy, I think a large part of it is, is borne by the community itself. And I think the Muslim, the Muslim community of South Africa, you know, is way above, uh, you, you know, what this government has really been, been, uh, been giving us. And, I, and we take our hats off to, 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 you know, people out there that have played a prominent role in establishing these Muslim schools. Because you can imagine the type of infrastructure that's gone in and the type of money that's gone into it. But of course, you find that Allah's help is always there. And if it's done, the niyat is clear and the intention is clear, then I think, you know, all bodes well. And with the results, I think all of them have performed exceptionally well. Uh, Molana, in, you know, in the Gauteng, northern regions, we've got 30 schools, 30 Muslim schools. Mm -hmm. But overall, in the entire country, we've got over 80 Muslim schools. And I must tell you that Muslim schools perform like you can't believe. And I think the department always, you know, praises the, the, the Muslim schools. The universities especially commend Muslim schools for the types of students that we send to them to say that, you know, you give us the, the, the best of students and they perform exceptionally well even at university. So alhamdulillah, I think we, we're on the right track. And obviously, uh, you know, we're very proud of them. Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah for that. Alhamdulillah. Abdullah, are you also with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. And I can see you as well. I think you just need to perhaps move the, uh, the, the, the your, your device 
uh, because we, we're getting you in a landscape. Landscape. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could just move it to landscape, uh -huh. and then we can we can proceed. Aha, uh -huh, mashallah. Right. right. Okay. So Abdullah, I, I want I want to touch on something. Right. This 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 whole aspect of the hundred yeah. percent pass rate. Right. Uh, I understand its importance yep. in, in the sense that when all your students pass matric, it's, it's definitely an achievement. It's definitely something uh, to, to speak about. Uh, but is it sometimes a little overplayed? And the reason I ask this is because at times it could happen that a student or two or three, mm -hmm. depending on the size of the school, don't make it for whatever reason. I remember on my radio program some years ago, we interviewed a principal of one of the Muslim schools in the morning when the results were announced, and he was in absolute shock. There was one student who passed all the years, all the exams, the trials, and something just happened, and, and, and she failed the, you know, the matric exams, and all of a sudden now you don't get that 100%. What, what, what's your take on, on, on how we project that 100% as Muslim schools within the Muslim community? Have we made too much of it? Look, uh, Brother Molana, my view is very different because as an educationist traveled to various parts of the world where I saw institutions such as the Microsoft Innovative uh, School of the Year or School of the Century in uh, Philadelphia, USA, results are only part of what makes a school a school. And A's and B symbols or O level and A levels are only part of what makes a student a complete student or a holistic student. Mm -hmm. and therefore, I believe that the 100% pass rate you just introduced by Kadr Asmal is exaggerated sometimes to hyperbolic uh, levels because the, the child in a school doesn't develop only in the matric year. You need to look at the child's development from grade one onwards or from preschool onwards. In my opinion, the matric result should just be one part of an exercise to leverage a school into the domain of what I call international competition. Mm -hmm. Now, in South Africa, it is the end all and be all of judging a school because our education system in many ways are lopsided, you know, because if you look at the euphoria around the matric results, it is, it is so much and so, um, I would say, overplayed in many ways that we forget the child in the other circumstances of life because these results actually, if not favorable, has resulted in so many children taking their lives. Mm. Yet at the same time, we're not looking at this uh, scenario beyond the situation. We have had th last year 923,000 pupils writing the matric exam. In an article in the Sunday Times, universities in South Africa can only accommodate 126,000. What happens to the balance? There aren't enough FET institutions or skills trades facilities to accommodate these children so that we have less unemployment. More than 500,000 of these matriculants are going to add to the unemployment uh, statistics for this year. So what does it tell you? That schools in some way are preparing children only for white collar work, whilst the rest of the children who make up the majority are not catered for. And that for me is a problem. So the government has to, in many ways, flavor the community, I mean, flavor the matric result such that it looks pleasing and shows that the country is on an upward trajectory. And then when you look at the load shedding and all of that in the country, it tells you another story, you see. And that is my problem, that we need to appreciate the 100% pass rate. We need to appreciate the move of uh, education efficiency in the country. We need to appreciate all of that. But at the same time, we must look at how much in tandem is mm. the education with the development of the country. Given this, Mulana, ask yourself this question, and I want listeners to ask themselves this question as well. For more than 20 years now, South Africa has been on this 100% chase pass rate. How come we are not in the, uh, we are not in, we are not racing with the International Space Station? How come our inventive spirit in the country has declined? Yeah. How come we are no more a role player in many ways? So that's my take, inshallah. I'm sure we have much more to debate on. So jazakallah khair for that question. Ismail, on that very question, your, your, your quick thoughts? I think what uh, Brother Abdullah is saying, you know, we're overplaying this. Mm. Unfortunately, it's the barometer by which we are judged. Yeah. You know, uh, the 100%, if you don't get it, 
the principal and the teachers get the blame. So it works two ways. My take is that it's definitely the barometer, because the moment you don't perform 100%, you know, the public is in uproar. So as much as I agree, and I definitely agree with him, are we preparing our learners for the world out there? And my message to them always, mm. my matriculants especially, and I tell them that the certificate you're getting here is not worth the paper it's written on. Because when you step out of the gates of any school, any institution, the world out there is dog eat dog. Mm. Are you prepared for that? And I don't think the system that we have, the educational system that we have, uh, is preparing the children to go out there. The level is very low. Uh, you know, when you talk of a 30% pass rate, uh, I, it's debatable. I was at the Umalusi when we received our accreditation, and when I asked them, you know, the spin doctors keep on mm. uh, revolving around lots of things. But my take is that 30%, if you're passing a child, what's the point of writing an exam? You might as well let them go to the mall the whole day, and at the end of the year, just put them through the system. That's what, what we're basically doing. As Abdullah mentioned, over 500,000 are going to be unemployed. And what are we doing about that? Is yeah. there any improvement? Is there any light at the end of the tunnel that we're seeing that, you know, there is going to be an improvement? I don't see it. All right. Absolutely. Time for a commercial break. When we come back, we continue the discussion on Muslim schools with our guests. Welcome back. So we are coming to you live this evening from Sunning Hill here in uh, Santa Johannesburg. We're talking Muslim schools. What have we achieved? Where are we? And where should we be aiming to go from here? Uh, our guest in studio, Mr. Ismail Hassam, he is the current principal of the Rustenburg Muslim School. And then we've got um, Brother Ibrahim Saluji. Uh, he's with EMS. I think he's also with the Indonesia Muslim School, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Brother Abdullah Suji, who's currently the vice principal at the Al Fala Muslim School out in uh, Durban. L let's go to um, Ibrahim Bai. Ibrahim Bai, I, you know, the, the, the issue of where we are as Muslim schools. How would you describe our, our, our current situation? If we were to do a quick SWOT, as they would say, currently, what are the strengths of Muslim schools? And also, at the same time, what are the weaknesses? What are the challenges? Zakala Molana, I think uh, we need to understand that the Muslim schools have progressed for the last 33 years, that we've really grown from strength to strength. And, and you know, the, the learners in our, in our institutions are doing exceptionally well with the type of educators we have. However, I think the, the, the emphasis, as Abdullah, Brother Abdullah has put it, that we emphasize too much on the matric pass rate, mm. whilst I think we forget the one very impo important component of our dean, and that is akhlaq of the child. And I think whilst we, you know, we pay so much attention to what marks we get, we neglect the most important factor, and that is akhlaq. And I think that that is something that we need to look at very, very seriously. Going forward, I think that's one of the features that we'd like to focus on, because you must understand, like any other school, we have we, we, we have all the, all the, all the dilemma that goes into any other school, be it bullying, be it you know uh, disrespect, all these types of things come up to the front, and you find that uh, take take even things like uh, drug abuse. I mean, these things are happening in our schools as well. So obviously, whilst we, you know we have, we have a community where we've got Muslim schools, we are doing well, but we also have our challenges, and I think the future. Uh, we are going. We are looking at all those aspects, which I think will make up, you know, the, the, the core of our, of our of our learners. Uh, it's very well having a, a student who goes with seven A's to the university and performs exceptionally well. But when it comes to akhlaq and respect and you know interaction with other people, then you know you you fall far short. And I think that's very very important that we need to we need to consider those factors in our schools. And uh, and I think there, there isn't a school that can tell me that, you know, their school is 100%. There isn't. There are lots of problems. And these problems come because of the community, the type of interaction, the, the, the media that plays such a prominent role. You find that the TV, uh, you know, the society itself, peer pressure, all these things, you know, uh, influences a particular child. And we, we, I think we do not pay, uh, you know, we don't address that issue. We're all rushing for the 100% pass rate and we neglect, you know, the most important factor in, in, our, in our institution. And that is the character of the child. And I think that is something we need to look at very, very seriously going forward. Abdullah, on, on that point, I hear a criticism of Muslim schools come up uh, ever so often that, uh, yes, academically we've achieved very well. And I think all the guests have contributed to that point in our first segment that the universities commend <laughs> us, the, the, the department commends us, the government commends us in terms of the academic caliber of, of the students that we produce in the main. 
Uh, Ibrahim Bay touches on the issue of akhlaq. The, 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 the challenge, I suppose, is what, what barometer do you use to be able to kind of assess akhlaq? Uh, academics, yes, you can, you can see the marks, you can see the distinctions, you can see, uh, you know, the percentage of bachelor passes and that kind of thing. Uh, at one Muslim school, I, I know a teacher made a remark once when we were, you know, on our rounds doing some workshops that uh, I look uh, at my students 10, 15, 20 years after they've graduated and see what kind of lives they live as Muslims. And that's my barometer to see whether we succeeded as a Muslim school with that student or not. Um, their, their dress code, their values, uh, to what extent they are community-centric, uh, not just, you know, accumulating wealth for, for personal gratification and, 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 and selfish purposes, to what extent uh, they are ambassadors of, of the deen. If we use that as a kind of broad, loose barometer, uh, from that perspective, what would your opinion be, Abdullah, in terms of how Muslim schools have fared in the last 30 years? The quality of, of Muslims that we have produced in terms of their identity and their vo vo uh, values, the academics aside. Uh, that's a very interesting question and also a loaded question. You see, we must look at how Muslim schools are managed from the top down, because they themselves, the managers themselves, are the barometers of the character that we want in the school. The principal, him or herself, is also a character whose influence will shape the akhlaq of the children. When you look at the entire structure, how our people are treated in Muslim schools, how we treat each other, what is the staff room discussion or what are the uh, issues that make up the politics in the school all heirs to what we call the ethos of the school. And children learn with their eyes, to quote Mirza Yawar Beg. So in Muslim schools, I think teachers have to become the first behave models of behavior. And the criticism of Muslim schools are there because people don't uh, throw stones at food bearing trees, you know, uh, at, uh, they only throw stones at fruit bearing trees, rather, should I say. So the barometer, in opinion, of judging character would be how often children would greet you in the quad, as an example, mm. how salah is managed in the school, do you have to beg children to come for salah, do you have to maintain order with a loud voice in the Jamaat Ana or Musalla area? Do you, have, do you have many behavioral problems with non-Muslim, with Muslim children, with non-Muslim teachers? And how much of, I would say, behavior problems as opposed to antisocial, as, as opposed to drugs and all of that do you have in the school? When you look at all of this together and you find that your children must behave very often, for example, with non-Muslim teachers, you know you've got an akhlaq problem in the school. <laughs> When you find teachers complaining too much of noise in the classroom because of whatever reason, you know you've got some behavioral issues. Those are what I call observable things. Mm -hmm. And I like the point you mentioned of the person who said years down the line, you will judge what the, uh, what the impact of the Muslim school had on the child. In the Muslim school here at Al Falah, in the Islamic department, which is quite robust as well in discussion and debate, we said the following, and I think this is words of advice as well. The school is judged academically on the metric result, but the nature of the society, especially of those children who attended Muslim schools, is judged by how those parents who have come out of Muslim schools who will, per, who will parent their children and how their children will behave in schools. Mm -hmm. So it's very much more long-term. Yeah. Finally, Molana, you cannot judge character on one instant behavior. By and large, if you look at our Muslim schools receiving the awards, they came in the Islamic hijab. They had so much of modesty that was not a show, but a genuine sign of bashfulness because of how they were institutionalized on Islamic values in the school. And this goes across the country. In fact, one can say internationally too. So we don't know immediately, but we can see in the action of our children mm -hmm. when they are in public. And finally, you will notice from Muslim schools in the main, and this is my observation, that it is a child or children from Muslim schools who at university are the imams 
of the musalla in the university, and they are the heads of many Islamic societies or programs that forward a view that needs a moral standing. And that is a solid indication that Muslim schools are having a very solid and important role to play. Jazakallah. Barakallah. So I want I want to uh, explore that point a little bit further with you because I think that's at the core of of, of you know this discussion around uh, where Muslim schools are, where they should be, and you know what we should look for in terms of the future. If I can just bring in something, uh, this morning I was reading an article uh, written by a journalist in India about Hashim Amla, and he retired. I think it was yesterday from all forms of of, of cricket. He retired from international cricket some years ago, and uh, he said that when when you speak to the teammates of Hashim Amla, they say. We, we acknowledge him first for his qualities as a human before we acknowledge him for his remarkable qualities as a cricketer. So if we take that same barometer and apply it to Muslim schools over a period of, of, of three decades, uh, would you say that in the main, our, our, our graduates pass that test where they are seen as good Muslims before they are seen as academic achievers, you know, over a prolonged period of time, you know, after having been outside of, of, of the Muslim school environment? Or is it isolated instances of stars whose akhlaq was remarkable, who became, you know, community leaders, who gave back to society, uh, and, and, and you know, did those kind of things which makes a Muslim school different from any other private school that focuses primarily on, on, on academics? Saying that, I mean, we all know we have challenges, right? I mean, even very spiritual environments, even in a hifz class, even in a dar you, you you're fighting a culture. You're fighting a, uh, a society, you're fighting social media trends and, and, and impressions now. Even the, the, the most pious of people can't guarantee the outcome of their own children coming out from that very pious home because of the kind of society and world, digital world that we live in. But coming back to that point, I mean, you, you've been there from, from day one when it comes to Muslim schools. When you look back and you say, in terms of the quality of the product, uh, as far as Islamic identity, values, giving back to the community, all of those things, how have we fared? Jazakallah for that question. You know, it's when I look at the inception of Muslim schools, initially the, uh, the input of the ulama was very, he very heavy. And the one thing I remember, uh, Mulana Abbas Ali, uh, great scholar, he mentioned one thing and he said, we, we establish in Muslim schools, we need to produce characters that when they come out of a Muslim school after 12 years of schooling, mm. we don't want a child with a Muslim name. We want a practicing Muslim child. And as Muslim schools, we need to do introspection. Have we achieved? How far have we gone on that? And, you know, blankly I can say, we failed miserably. Because if you, if you look at, if you have to give an, uh, an, uh, an award for akhlaq in a school, you probably have five or six candidates that will qualify for that. The rest of them, you know, it's questionable. Now, I'm not being judgmental on that, mm -hmm. but I'm saying as, as people in, in positions, right, we have to choose that. And when you look at the, the overall picture, I think, you know, the emphasis has been too much on the, 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 the secular side. And, and we're guilty of it. All schools are guilty of that because that is the barometer we judged on. We're not judged on, you know, the, 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 the school, how it's run or who's in charge of it and what's happening there. We are missing that point. And I agree, uh, you know, that w the holistic development of that child, we haven't succeeded 100%. There's a lot of room for improvement. And I think what has happened is that most of the ulama that were in the, uh, in the schools with, from the inception, like uh, Mulana Yahya Bam, Bam Marhum, uh, played a great role. Mulana Gardi, Mulana Zahir Ragi. You know, these people played an important role in developing the schools. But the fact that they're no more really involved at that grassroots level has left a very big gap. It's actually a chasm, you know, I mean, uh, which is not being filled. We need greater involvement from the ulama to guide us as leaders of the schools, to guide our teachers, so that we can then translate that into the child. But we are not perfect. Mm. But we need that guidance, and we're not getting it. Too much polarity in communities, uh, you know, the ulama against Muslim schools, uh, against secular education. They've come out openly in, the, in these issues. So, you know, that becomes an, uh, a stumbling block for us as well because we're not really getting the cooperation of them. You call them to school to give a talk or something, uh, I'm too busy. Uh, yeah. And that, that's, that's, to me, it's a big problem. 
Rabbi, let me bring you in on that point, right? So I think it's an interesting point that Ismail Bay raises. One is you have a lot of ulama involvement in terms of employment. So you'll have many ulama employed in, in Muslim schools teaching subjects. Do you feel that Muslim schools need greater involvement of ulama at board level, at consultant level, uh, and also ulama support in an indirect form where, where you actually encourage people to support Muslim schools and, 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 and to support a strengthening of Muslim schools? Every Muslim school has got ulama on their staff, hmm. both uh, you know, you know, at high school and in the primary school. You do have them there. But we need to look at this in perspective. You know, it's not only the school that plays a meaningful role of the development of the character. That character development starts where? It starts in the home. It starts from the family. Hmm. And I'll give you very classic examples. You'll find that a parent, a mother, will drop their child off at school. She'll be dressed in hijab and whatever. The minute the child gets off, the hijab comes off, she goes back home, she's, you know, the, the Islamic value is not there. When the children come back into the car after school, the same thing happens. So you find that the home environment plays a pivotal role in the development of the character of the child. Because bear in mind, the, who, who, who is the one that builds the character in the first instance? It's the mother. Sure. When the child is born, it's suckled by the mother. So, so that character development comes from within the home itself. So by the time the child is at the age of six or seven, or even in, in, in nursery school when they're at the age of maybe four or five, some character is already built by the parent. And if that, if that character development is not built at that level, I, I find it very difficult for educators to, to correct that when you've got 20 or 25 children in a class to try and do that. Because you must remember, education is a triangle. It's the parent, the educator, and the child. And if that, if that triangle is not there, and we know it is not there, when you have a parent's day, who comes to the school to come and see how is my child doing? It's usually the child who's doing very well, and he's perhaps, you know, character is good, but the, but, but uh, the others don't come. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you find that there are single parents where you find, you know, broken homes, broken families. All these things play an important role in the development of the child. And we as a community, we as a society, I think we generally have failed as parents to, to, to really nurture our children in the manner that we should be. Uh, and I think that, that that is a major problem. I, we can't expect the educator in the school, you know, to, to, to mold the child into someone he is not when he's already come, uh, come from a home, which is a broken home, or perhaps where, you know, there's, 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 there's no akhlaq, there's no good character, there's, you know, there's drug abuse in the home or between the father and the mother, there are fights and arguments. All these things impact on the child. And like Abdullah has said, children, see what you know they hear with the eyes not with the ears so what they see that's what they practice and and i think that we need to look at it holistically to say that how do we correct that going back into the home if i ask a question that how many teachers or how many educators really know their children very well as to what type of background their homes come how many educators communicate with the parents apart from the parents day mm. does he pick up the phone and say you know i've got your child how is he doing you know is he okay at home uh, is there any way that I can assist or is there any communication between the parents? And I think all these things are lacking. So if we need to introspect and, and find solutions as a community, as a Muslim community in South Africa to say, how do we correct this holistically rather than leaving this particular problem only to the, to the school itself? Because I don't think you're, not, you're going to get it right. If you leave it at that level only. We need to start from the home and from the from a very grassroots to develop that child to become what he or she really wants to become. And I think that, I think that's our ma major problem, really. All right, time for another break. When we come back, we continue the discussion. We're talking the state of Muslim schools. All right, welcome back to the final segment of the program. We're talking Muslim schools this evening in light of the matric results. But we're talking about Muslim schools from a more comprehensive and holistic perspective the last 30 odd years and, and the way forward. So, Abdullah, if, if I have to ask you, right, to list three things, we, we've spoken extensively about akhlaq and character development. Uh, apart from that, three things which you feel should be the key focus areas in terms of the growth and the vision of Muslim schools for the next 30 years in South Africa, what would you list? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You see, Molana, there's a gentleman by the name of T.J. Cottle. Now, T.J. Cottle actually had what they call the circle test. He made people, or he made students, or his, or his members that he was dealing with, draw three circles. 
He named each one past, present, and future. And he said, cut it out, put it in front of you in any way that you'd like. So the general happened where the small circle was always labeled the past. The medium circle was always named the present. Mm -hmm. And the largest circle was always named the future. Right? Now... In the book that you will find this in, right, it's quite interesting to note, and I will get your answer very quickly, The Seven Cultures of Capitalism by Charles Hampden. He, he says that developing countries or the, uh, the seven best capitalist countries, they differed in how they looked at the past and how they looked at the present and the future. But a country like Japan, as small as it is, and Singapore, they would do something very unique. They would draw the past, the present, and future as merging circles. So they saw the past having a direct impact on the future. Having said that, the present is where you shape how the future will actually un uh, unfold. Now, three things that Muslim school must actually do is to take note of something we forget. And that is the, uh, you know, there's a book written also by Alan Mikhail, it calls God's shadow on Salim Mehmet, who, uh, in two, whose uh, 506th anniversary of the, uh, of the conquest of Constantinople happens around this time. And he says in that book, he shows that the Muslim empire developed as a result of strategic planning of a people to rule. Number two, the Osmanli Empire or Ottoman Empire progressed because there was a definite effort made at technological advances. And the third aspect was a deliberate attempt, deliberate establishment at developing leaders. So our schools have to move out of this ambit of making the metric result the end all and be all of schooling. We should, as an example, introduce life coaching as a, as a, uh, as part of teaching. So children become more engaged with the self to see how they can be leaders of the world that is changing as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. and that will take you a long way into 30 years. Our schools must become research laboratories, not only on physical objects or, or the physical creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also on the mind and how it works. Uh, thought processes, uh, think tanks of the future, project planning, scenario-based planning. So we need to take time out of our school and do this. And the third thing we need to do is teach our children how to be skills orientated. Now, Salim Mehmed in the book, uh, as I explained, called Shadow, in the madrasas of the Ottoman Empire, it's not as a madrasa that we know it, as a maktab as we understand it. It was a place where a child learned sword fighting, he learned calligraphy. He learned from a professional politician of the time, in inverted commas, on how to think strategically. And then he was put into a guild where he became a mason or he became some part of a, uh, or he became part of a community-based project of a wakaf. Now, these big things, the child was involved in from the age of perhaps 12 and 11. While the early years, the child was schooled to understand what is good behavior, what is good akhlaq and the Japanese have really mastered that. So we really have to refocus on how we deal up with schools. And we need to really, as a matter of fact, and this is my opinion, mm. move away from judging schools on, a, on, the, on the metric result entirely. Start looking at what role a child can actually play in society. I cannot remember the name, but there's one child from, uh, I think it was uh, from um, Finland, if I'm not mistaken, who, who actually... Uh, in her kayak, went over the oceans talking to people about how plastic is polluting the oceans. And she actually addressed the United Nations at the age of 13 or 14. And that is what we need to see yeah. in the Ummah. And if you look at the history of Islam, and I'll end on this point, young people were leaders of armies. And they were not just there to swing the sword. No, no. They were intelligent, strategic thinkers who could eventually take over the country and rule. Today, revolutionary governments have taken over a country and, and look what they've done to countries. They've really messed it up. 
to the point where it's irrecoverable and the entire Africa, which is so rich in the resources, is in debt to the IMF, hence the lack of leadership, the lack, the lack of thought-provoking uh, actions and strategic thinking. So our schools have to move in this direction, which means we need to move away from this idea of uh, what I call CAPS, curriculated, uh, CAPS curriculum thinking, where it's just, it's just dense theory, dense theory, but no thinking. Yeah. Ismail, your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I mean, what, what should be the, the, the key areas of, of uh, developing a vision for Muslim schools for the next 20 to 30 years? See, again, I go back to the inception. And we had Molana Ali Adam from Cape Town. And they were, at that time, thinking of putting up a research center mm. where we need to delve into the history of Islam. Not just the Sira is important. The lives of the Khalif, very important. But when you talk to a child and you say, Islam ruled over Spain for over 700 years. Mm. What do we know about that? So the curriculum is, you know, I wouldn't say tailor-made. It's, it's like channeled into one direction. And it's not giving us the proper perspective of what we can do. We were at that stage, I remember very clearly, and Ibrahim May will uh, bear me out, we were talking of setting or developing our own textbooks in line with what, what Islamic thinking is. We never got down to that. Finance was a problem. Personnel was a problem. Uh, so these are the, the, uh, the things that kept us behind. My take on it is still, I feel rightly now that the ulama need to take a huge step in this direction. And that's why you know, I've turned to people like you, uh, Monana. I have a high regard for you, uh, your lectures. And I feel that you, know, you, you, you have the ability to come to schools and convince them. EMS has not played the role that they should be playing. Mm. Because again, I go back to the inception. We've been to As Salam, we've been to Poch, we've been to Roshni, five day workshops. We, you know, at Swane Muslim School, CIS, I, the list goes on and on. These workshops have stopped completely. Mm. All we do is we have four meetings in a year and that's it. Not even well attended, uh, nothing happens. And we have a soccer tournament that crowns the year. What is the role of EMPS in this? EMPS needs to be more proactive in this to get people involved to go around. We're not all qualified. Uh, I, I take the point Abdullah is making brilliant suggestions. But how do we start at that point? How do we get to that point? It's, the, it's easy to say that. I respect Abdullah's viewpoint because it's, what he's saying is exactly what we should be doing. When youth were put into uh, leadership in the armies above great sahaba that were there, mm. but they were strategists. They had the mentality to do things. We don't have that. And we need the guidance from the ulama. That's why I'm, I, you know, I beg you all the time, mm. and your colleagues, that you know what, you need to come to my school. And my non-Muslim teachers are asking for your assistance. Because we need that guidance. We need the workshops. Because uh, I'm from old school. Yeah. Uh, you know, and my thinking is there. Uh, uh, OK, the peripheral vision is there. Generally, there's a total change in the demographics today. Uh, Muslim schools, when we started at the inception, we all started with Muslim teachers. Today, it's not that. And I don't have anything against my non-Muslim teachers because I think they do a fantastic job, mm. sometimes better than our own. But they need to be guided as well. Sure. And there's a thirst for this, which we are not fulfilling. And I still feel that the, 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 the influence of the ulama is vitally important. We're not perfect. Yeah. We're not 100% Sharia compliant, but to a point, we are better than the state school because what we offer, they can't offer. Yeah. And also with this LGBTQ1 that's coming in, they're never going to infiltrate Muslim schools to say that you must have uh, non-segregated toilets. They can stand on their head, it's never going to happen. Inshallah, so, yes. you know, from that point, we need your people's assistance. No, for sure, inshallah. I mean, I have in the last two or three years with my colleagues been going to various Muslim schools across the country and doing workshops, but you're right. We, we all need to up our, our involvement and our contribution. Ibrahim, I was going to ask you about the EMS uh, issue, and, and I see Ismail Bay has brought it up. Uh, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of good work that EMS does, but one hears this criticism fairly often that, that, um, that EMS predominantly now is, is, is becoming about uh, the, the annual tournament, uh, a, a couple of workshops here and there. It's not playing the role that it was envisaged to play. Uh, would you agree with that? And, and if so, why? 
To a certain degree, gee, Molana, I would agree with that in that uh, Ismail Bhai is correct that we have, you know, one one uh, meeting per per term and we have four meetings for, for the year. That's not enough. We need to be more proactive. And I think that the EMS is looking at, at some futuristic programs. The first one is, of course, the developing libraries and research resource centers in all our Muslim schools. We're looking at that project. We've advertised a position for, a, for an Islamia coordinator because our, I think our Islamia program is based on the maktab system. Uh, we are using books which are being used in the maktab, which I think is falls far short of, of the type of uh, books that we need to use and the type of curriculum that we need to introduce in our Muslim school. So obviously we need to look at ve that very, very seriously. So we've, we've advertised that position uh, and, and shortly we will be going out on that. We also want to introduce quality assurance in all our schools to make sure that you know our educators are playing their part the way they should. The school is playing its part, and how do we, uh, how, you know how, how do we improve in matters that that, that we've already failed and and we, we have failed miserably. Yes, I agree with Ismail by that in the past we had we had wonderful workshops and lots of good things were coming out. But we must also understand that the educators we have today come from an institution which are which are Western based. They are not. They are not coming out from Islam, Muslim institutions where that we are taught and trained as, as Muslim thinkers, and that is something that we've been uh, talking about for a long time. To create an institution where we have teacher training of Muslim teachers, where they will learn how you know the processes of Islamization of, of, of the curriculum and things like that. So those are some of the projects that we have in mind, and we certainly are going to look at that very very seriously in this year and going forward. So inshallah. There are some programs that, that that's on the cards, and I think that the future does look good. However, uh, I must mention, Molana, that at one time, South Africa was looked upon by the world in terms of Islamic education, and I, I remember very clearly the LMA syllabus, which was used in the UK, was used in the States, was used in Australia. Mm. Today, we've fallen back so far that the scholars are now in the UK, they're in America, and they're in Australia, and we've fallen behind, and I think we need to do catch-up. Absolutely. And it's, it's a serious, it's a serious situation that we need to do this. Whilst we create our doctors and lawyers and accountants, we must create the best of Muslim doctors, the best of Muslim accountants, the best of Muslim, uh, whatever uh, you know uh, career you follow, you must be the best, but you must be the best Muslim orientated, you know, artisan in whatever you do. So your akhlaq has to has to be there in every aspect of your life, from your actions, your deeds, and everything else. And I think it's become too materialistic that everything is based on finance and money and money talks. And you know, and a parent uh, makes a contribution to a school, you 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 hold him up to high heaven. It's that's that, that shouldn't be so. Absolutely. You've got to teach people that you know you respect people for their moral behavior and not their financial situation. And I think that these are some of the things that we need to correct. And I, and I agree that with Ismail by that we need to we need to relook, we need to revisit, and we we intend having a boss barat where I think we need to start you know reorganizing and relooking and revisiting some of the things that we have done and what is the way forward for in the future. Yes, I'm 100% that that is the way that we should be going. And we need the help of the ulama, people like you, people like Malana Ibrahim Ba, Malana Ragi. We've got, some, we've got some great scholars that are there, but we're not tapping that, 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 that skill that is there within our own communities. And I think you know, we're guilty of that and we should remedy that. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I must uh, thank all three of you, Ismail Bai, Ibrahim Bai, and uh, Abdullah out in, uh, in Durban uh, for your time and for your frank thoughts and for the um, very interesting uh, observations that you've shared with us. Uh, we couldn't do justice to the topic, but I think hopefully we've left our viewers with some food for thought. Until next time, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.